Hello, we are continuing our lectures on physics informed machine learning and in this case we're going to look at another application and another techniques of physics informed machine learning. The application is on 3D printing and um, we are trying to understand what parameters affect the quality of the 3D printed part. Specifically we're going to look at um, fused deposition molding that's FDM and uh, we are looking at a specific type material, in this case the thermoplastic material that we are printing and uh, then we are testing it in tension and we are looking at the tensile strength. If you have done any 3D printing before, um, you know that there are quite a few parameters that you can set and these parameters all affect the quality at the end. Uh, not just the strengths, but also dimensional changes and then if you have any warpage and so on, the, the, the quality of the surface and so on and so forth. So nozzle temperature is something when you are printing these things, uh, it's uh, melted and um, extruded through um, a nozzle which um, basically heated to temperature above um, the melting temperature of that material. Um, you can set that in temperature quite higher than the melting temperature of the material or very close to that. Um, this 3D printer chamber itself can be heated to a specific temperature. Uh, the platform that you are printing on that can be heated to a specific temperature. So these are all the temperatures that can be set and fine-tuned that can affect the quality of the part um, later. The diameter of the nozzle um, 0.2 millimeters, 0.3 millimeters, 0.4 millimeters has an effect on the quality. Um, the thickness of these layers, you can take a look at here at the cross section of the failed specimen. Um, these are the, the standard ASTM standard tensile samplers and uh, they're broken and you can look at the cross section of the failed uh, specimen, you can see those layers. The thickness of those layers becomes another parameter that you can set at the beginning like 0.5 millimeters, 0.4 millimeters or what, one millimeter and that sets um, um, the quality, the printing speed, how fast you're placing this layer. Uh, the infill percentage, sometimes when you print, you put a bit of gap, you put a distance between them, or sometimes you do 100% um, fill. Um, An infill orientation, you can print, for example, in plus minus 45 or 0 90 with respect to the loading direction. Um, here, for example, what you can see um, is printed in a plus minus 45 degree direction, and then you're loading it in tension. Um, perpendicular to that. So any of these parameters plus other parameters that I'm not mentioning here can be set to affect um, the quality of the part and then at the end the strength of the material. So what we are trying to do to take some data that have been done uh, by varying these parameters and the strength has been measured and train a machine learning model that can correlate this inputs to outputs. To do this um, we are using a specific um, example from literature. It's a study done by Wang and co-workers in 2019 um, on a material called peak polyether ether ketone, um, 3D printed, and they provided um, the data in their publications. Um, the, da the data is provided to you in a CSV file. And in the data, we are varying a couple of parameters and we are um, um, keeping some of the parameters constant. So the nozzle temperature has been changed between 380 and 440 C, um, which is much higher than the melting temperature of the peak, which is around 340 C. The printing speed is between 17 to 26 millimeter per second. Um, the layer thickness has, uh, was varied between 0.5 uh, 0.1 to 0.5 millimeters. Uh, the nozzle diameter was varied between 0.4 to 0.8 millimeters. Then we have some constants. The chamber temperature was kept constant at 180C. Um, the platform, the built uh, temperature was kept at 280C. Uh, we are using 100% infill, so there is no gap between the, the layers, uh, so, so between the filaments. And we are using a plus minus 45 um, infill uh, direction. And then the tensile strength has been measured. And again, all of this is provided to you in a CSV file. So you can look at all of these columns, which each column represents one of these um, data. And then um, we, have, uh, we don't have a lot of data points. Uh, in, in fact, we only have 39 experimental data provided here. So it limits the type of machine learning approach you can do. Um, you can try to do neural networks, but it's probably not going to be too accurate with 39 data points. The approach we are going to take, uh, we are actually going to compare a couple of different approach. One is the baseline linear regression, just linear fitting of data. 
um, if it makes sense. But then we're going to use a bunch of um, ensemble methods based on decision tree. We're going to use bagging technique and uh, random forest. We're going to use boosting technique, which is the GBM and XG boost type um, algorithm. And again, if you don't remember um, the, um, the Mm, uh, the bagging technique is the one that you train a bunch of estimators and then you average the data and the boosting technique is the one that you train one estimator and then you make it better and better and better. Um, first we're going to do like the baseline um, traditional machine learning fitting. Um, a Python code has been provided um, to you, 3dprint.py. Um, it's just a simple of um, bringing all of this algorithm, um, typically from scikit-learn, uh, but um, XGBoost is um, imported from a different library, but most of these are available in uh, standard scikit-learn library. You load the data, um, so the file is loaded, and then uh, you create um, the pandas framework, um, DF, and the pandas framework, um, you have all of these um, columns, which are uh, five inputs, and then one output. So there are six columns that you're bringing into this pandas framework. And then we split the data into 25% for test and 75% for um, training. Um, there are hyperparameters for training these um, ensemble methods that affect the uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, for example, I mentioned this again in the, in the introduction, um, the number of estimators, the um, the depths, um, the number of maximum leaves that you can have, all of these affect uh, the problem. So in this case, without setting any of these, we create a library of potential values, and we do a random search between them to find the best function. And we're going to do that uh, quite a few times. So you set the number of iteration to 30. So we do this training for each of these models 30 times based on this provided um, list of hyperparameters. And then the algorithm uh, reports um, the best function out of them. This is done using this um, approach called randomized, um, uh, sorry, random, uh, randomized search uh, CV. And, um, Again, we're going to do this 30 times. You can add more, and uh, it makes it a bit slower. And at the end, so we're going to look at the R2 score of the, um, how good um, is the fit, and we're going to rank the models out of the five models, which is the linear regression, um, decision tree, random forest, and the two um, uh, boosting techniques. We're going to rank them based on the best R2 they have. But for each of them is the best R2 score out of all the uh, 30 tried hyperparameter combination that we have. If you run the code, um, it's going to create a table like this for you. Um, and it's going to plot um, the tensile strengths versus predicted tensile strengths. So in the perfect scenario, when you have 100% R2, everything should be on a 45 degree line. Here you can see um, the testing data and the training data in different colors. So the training is, is done on the pink colors and the blue ones are um, the testing data. Um, the best fitted model, and these are basically um, ranked uh, based on the R2 on the test, not on the training. You can see that all the ensemble methods, they have very good training score but uh, they are actually not doing very well in the test score. They're so bad that actually the linear regression, which is like the simplest model you can choose, does a better job in having um, a test score. Um, so you can see the linear regression performance here, um, which again shows you if it was perfect um, a model, everything would align 45 degree. The fact that there's a uh, um, spreads over a zone around the 45 degree angle, which means that um, it has, it's not the perfect accuracy and it's had a 76% accuracy in this case. And again, to summarize, this is one linear regression. Then you have 30 iterations of each of these four approaches based on different hyperparameters. And these are the best of each category, which is reported. Even with that, they are not matching the linear regression. So in the second approach, we are trying to figure out the physics and implementing physics here. If you look at how the um, 3D printing is done, you're melting thermoplastics. It goes through the nozzle, melted, and it's deposited on the layer. It has a bit of time, and during that time, it solidifies into the final shape. Um, 
there is a heat transfer problem here, of course. You are melting something, you're placing it on a bed that has its own temperature, underlying layers that have their own temperatures, and there's convection um, with the chamber temperature in it. So it goes back, becomes very similar to the first case that we did. There is a convection and conduction um, that are competing. But there's one more physics here which sets the strength. Um, when you melt two thermoplastic layers and you put them side by side, um, surface, te surface tension becomes effective in that geometries and sizes and start pooling these um, uh, layers together. You can kind of see them from the literature, a simulation of that phenomenon and experimentally if you have two droplets close together, what will happen? That is, of course, uh, related to how viscous are these and how large is the surface tension effect, how much time you have, all of these things. But um, in cases where you provide enough time with the right conditions for these melted thermoplastics, they flow during 3D printing and um, they fill the gaps between them. Because if you look at the way they're deposited, they, they create gaps between these filaments. So if you do the condition right, you will get uh, very small voids. If you don't have a good condition, uh, you solidify um, these uh, melted um, filaments very quickly so they don't have time to flow and fill all the gaps, you will get very large voids. Small voids mean higher strengths in this case, large voids mean lowest strengths. So in a way, we can say strength approximate is related to one over how much void you have. Larger voids you have, you have um, lower strengths. How much this affected? If you have, by other parameters, if you have higher surface tension, gamma, you have less void. If you have more time to fill the voids, you have a less void. If you have very low viscosity, so the, the material can flow easily, you have less void. So um, you can say that the strength is related to surface tension times time over viscosity. If, assuming that um, surface tension doesn't change, if we keep that constant, you can say that the strength is related to one over void, which is related to time over viscosity. And time over viscosity, we can define it as flow index. Um, it's not a constant value because uh, you're melting this um, thermoplastic filaments and it has a certain amount of time to fill the voids. During that time, its viscosity changes. So if you take it, the integral of the time and the viscosity during that time, uh, during that period, um, you will get a parameter we call flow index, which should be related to strength. So in order to get the flow index, um, I conducted a 1D finite element analysis. And the 1D finite element analysis is like this. You have a, blat, uh, you have a flat um, built plate with a given temperature, T platform. You put the first layer on top of that with a given thickness. Um, so its temperature is initially very high and it just drops quickly because it hits the surface temperature. Then you have to wait for a while so the, the nozzle goes and come back to put the second layer on top. The moment it puts the second layer on top, it melts the lower layer so the temperature goes above its melting temperature and then it cools down again. And um, if you wait for the third layer to come back, again, the temperature increases slightly but maybe it doesn't melt completely and cool down. So every layer that you put in, it affects the lower layers and might melt them again. Um, if you look at the entire history of how much of that time you have a melted layer and what's the viscosity of that melted layer during that time, you can add them up together to create, to calculate the flow index. And that's how we, uh, I came up with the flow index value for all of these 39 experiments. You can see that the, the layer thickness and then the, the chamber tem temperature and uh, the diameter, the many parameters affect uh, this flow index. So flow index was calculated with these 39 parameters and was added as a new column to the CSV file. It's the same CSV file that you have. So now we have five parameters 
that we're going to use to train a machine learning model. Um, nozzle temperature, um, the printing speed, the layer thickness, uh, nozzle diameter, and then the flow index value that we just calculated. it. So in the previous one, we were using four inputs. Now we have five inputs. And the last inputs was calculated using finite elements, and it's based on the underlying physics. And then we are calculating the we are correlating it to tensile strengths. Um, the same approach as before was done. The five types of models were trained, and hyperparameter optimization was done. The best one is um, a boosting approach, XGBoost, um, which gives you which gives you 85% score in R2, which is significantly higher than what we had before. Uh, so by just adding one additional input, which is trained, uh, which is based on the underlying physics. Um, we are increasing the, the accuracy of the model significantly. Just to compare, um, this one on the left is um, your original machine learning model, four inputs, one output, and this one on the right is four inputs from plus one physics-informed input, which is the flow index, and you can compare um, the spread, how, how wide the spread is for each of them, and how the accuracy has increased.